All right, uh, the started. I thank you all for joining our discussion today. My name is Angela Grimes. I am the CEO of Born Free USA, and we are very happy to have you uh, joining us today for this conversation about the wildlife trade and how it's impacting biodiversity, habitat loss, and, and, and especially the pandemic that we're all living through today. In this devastating pandemic, it's certainly put a spotlight on the wildlife trade in the, you know, throughout the world, through internationally, uh, on the risks of health and human safety, and the inherent cruelty that comes with the wildlife trade. This is something that Born Free USA has been working on for many years. Uh, we've been an active NGO participant in the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, commonly known as CITES. We've worked on issues of ivory poaching, bear bile, and gallbladder trade, both in the US and in China, on the pet trade, including in big cats, uh, which might have also come into uh, the public spotlight recently with that Netflix series, uh, as well as with primates, which is of a particular concern for Born Free USA with our primate sanctuary that is home to more than 450 monkeys who have been rescued from the pet trade and other abusive situations. Today's discussion is going to highlight the role played by the wildlife trade in the spread of zoonotic diseases and those similar to COVID-19. We're gonna talk about how we are responding to this threat, give some perspective on the impact that pandemic has had on conservation and the work that we lead, and then talk about some of our recommendations for the future. Our presenter today is Alice Stroud, and she will, uh, she will discuss these issues. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping notes. The webinar is going to last about one hour. Elise will speak for 30 minutes, and then we will have some time to answer your questions. So I encourage you to use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. You can type in your questions, and then at the end, I will read those out for Elise to respond to. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce Elise. Elise is Born for USA's policy, Africa Policy and Capacity Building Director. She is a French lawyer specialized in international environmental and natural resources law. She has 16 years of experience leading Africa-based capacity building programs. Her current focus is developing the ability of African governments to strengthen their resources and to combat wildlife crime. She also contributes to the reinforcement of legal frameworks for stronger wildlife protection at the national, regional, and international levels where she represents and advocates for Born Free USA. Elise, I'm going to turn the microphone and the screen over to you now. Well, thank you, Angela, and hi, everyone. I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to join you from France, where we're slowly, slowly uh, getting out of our eight weeks of confinement. Um, I run programs in West and Central Africa for Born for USA to preserve wildlife species and their habitat. And tonight, uh, as part of my presentation, I'm going to give you um, some perspective on the link between zoonotic diseases and biodiversity threats. As you all have seen from the various news reports, the virus responsible for the outbreak that we are all um, and, and the victim of um, had most likely originated in animals that were in trade. So I'm going to be speaking to you about the impact of wildlife trade. And I'm going to give you some perspective on our response to this threat, and in particular, our recommendation to launch the Global Nature Recovery Initiative. And so very briefly, um, what is the link between zoonotic diseases and biodiversity? Uh, we know that populations of wild animals carry a high diversity of zoonotic pathogens, which I'm sure you're all aware, aware now. Um, those are um, diseases, that, pathogens that lead to diseases that can be transmitted from animals to humans. Out of 1.6 million potential viruses that are in mammals and birds, 700,000 could pose a risk to human health. 
we have about 60% of emerging infectious disease that are zoonotic, and 70% of these are sought to originate from wildlife. Now, if you think of pristine ecosystem, untouched habitat, this is not a very big threat to humans because in nature, wildlife species are not in close, necessarily in close proximity to one another or to humans. So the pathogens have a low risk of jumping from one animal to the next and to humans. When we run into trouble, however, is when we de decrease and kind of impact this ecosystem so that they're reduced and become smaller. And therefore, the species, different animal species are led to be in unnatural proximity to one another and to humans. If you look at this little square here on my slide, you can see the known factors that are uh, responsible for increases, increasing zoonosis emergence. And you can see clearly that all of the activities that lead with impacting these ecosystems, impacting these habitats, reducing them, damaging them, those are the ones that have an impact on the, on the emergence of zoonotic, zoonotic diseases. That and of course, wildlife trade, which I'm going to be discussing a little bit more shortly. But basically what we have to keep in mind is that the spread of zoonotic diseases is exacerbated by threats to biodiversity. So if we're going to think of an appropriate response to the spread of zoonotic diseases, we need to make sure that we address the threats to biodiversity, otherwise our solutions are not going to be preventing future pandemics like the one that we are exposed to today. So what is the, threat, the status of the biodiversity in the world today? I'm sure you're all well aware because you're all animal lovers, um, as, at least as part of, of su supporting the work that Born for USA does, that the world is experiencing a biodiversity crisis at the moment. In 2019, there was a report that was published by world-renowned scientists and their findings were very, very dire. We are currently experiencing a mass extinction event with nearly 1 million species at risk of extinction from human activities. 1 million species at risk of extinction. Nature as well is declining globally at unprecedented rates. 75% of land-based environment and 66% of the marine environment is significantly altered and over 85% of wetlands by area have been lost. Climate change is intensifying biodiversity loss. And in return, the loss of biodiversity for us in particular is preventing our ability to mitigate the impacts of climate change. And these findings are very, very concerning to Born for USA, especially regarding the mass extinction event that we are currently experiencing. If you look at this little frame on the bottom, le on the bottom left there, I'm giving you an illustration of the species that are at risk of extinction. And what I want to show you here, it's affecting all species. It's not just the mammals or the birds, it's all species that are affected by this extinction crisis. So the world and the decision makers are going to be soon discussing what their response is going to be. They were supposed to meet at a very important meeting in October this year, and that was to be discussing the uh, post-2020 global biodiversity framework within the Convention on Biodiversity Negotiations. This meeting has been postponed. It will be now occurring early 2021. And the purpose of that meeting is going to be to decide how we're going to react to the crisis. What are we going to do in the next 10 and 30 years? What are going to be our goals, our missions, our actions? And this is something which is very, very uh, important to our organization. Uh, we, our role is to really make sure that a, a proper response is given to this extinction crisis. Now, if we go a little bit further into the causes of the extinction crisis, the report highlighted two major factors. And the two major factors that were driven, driving the crisis were human exploitation and the disturbance of habitats. Now, human exploitation, of course, entails legal wildlife trade. 
And I'm giving you here some perspective on the impact that legal wildlife trade has on the conservation of biodiversity and the conservation of wildlife. And we know for a fact that traded species are more likely to be endangered than non-traded species, and that wildlife trade has the ability to decimate affected species in just a few years. And here again, if you look at the illustration on the slide, you can see that you have a wide range of species, being mammals, birds, reptiles, they are endangered, highly endangered, critically endangered, and they are in trade. So it is a really, really big threat. And our organization, just due to the conservation impact, recommends that trading wildlife should end. Now comes to this conservation impact, the public health risk that this activity presents through zoonotic diseases by bringing wildlife in close proximity to humans and species in close proximity to one another. Now, if you, think, if you think of wildlife trade, it is important to understand that we're not just talking about legal trade, which is in, in itself having a very, very damaging impact. There is also, of course, wildlife crime and illegal species trafficking. I'm giving you here a definition of wildlife crime. It's the official international definition. Basically, what we have to remember from this de definition is that it's very, very broad. It's anything that has to do with a behavior that is contrary to the laws that were adopted to protect natural resources and to administer their management and use. So wildlife crime will cover illegal exploitation of natural resources, processing of animals and plants into products, their transportation, offer for sale, sale or possession, concealing or laundering the financial profit made out of these crimes and violating the international rules that were adopted to protect species that are being in trade in our world. That's the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, CITES. If we think of wildlife crime in West Africa, species trafficking in particular, we have to remember that it affects a wild range of species in various different forms. And those species are most often highly, highly endangered. You will be familiar with the elephant and elephant ivory trade. There's a, lot, a wide range of trade in live animals for the pet trade, being birds or primates or reptiles. A wide range of trade um, in various products for big cats, skins, teeth, claws, bones. Uh, increasing trade in marine species, sea turtles or shark fins for shark fin soup in Asia. Also increasing trade in pangolin scales. And I'm going to kind of give a little bit perspective on pangolins, both because they're being discussed as, as part of the COVID-19 discussion that they might have been the intermediary host for this virus, but also because they're a good example on the kind of impact trade can have on a species. Pangolins were first uh, are in demand in Asia because of their scales, and they have been hunted almost to extinction over there. And now the demand has merged, has changed, and is now affecting African species for a use of scale in Asia. And we're seeing populations decimated in Africa now, with pangolin being the animals that are uh, the most trafficked species in the world. And then we have an increasing and concerning uh, amount of trade in timber, illegal timber trade, with vast areas of forests that are being completely logged, which of course is impacting habitat for all of the wildlife species that occupy this forest. So overall, if you think of the impact, um, the, the scale of wildlife trafficking uh, worldwide, is about 350 million specimens sold on the black market each year. And that is uh, enormous and very important, especially if you think of the max extinction event that is now taking place in the world. In the context of, uh, so for wildlife crime, uh, you can see here a map that gives you an idea of trafficking routes by air for wildlife products between 2009 and 2017. The reason why I put this map here is to show you that this is in fact an international 
trade. It's an illegal activity that's affecting all the countries, from the source countries, transit countries, destination countries all over the world. All of the countries are affected by, this, by the threat. And all along the trade chain, from the time that the animal or the specimens are collected to the time that they travel and transit to the time that they reach the market, they are exposing humans to zoonotic diseases by shedding viruses. Animals in illegal trade typically travel long distances from source to destination. They're typically going to be crowded with cages stacked on the top of each other, which facilitate exposure to the different species. And when an animal is stressed or injured, they shed viruses more easily and are more susceptible to infection and conditions are very, very unhygienic. So it's both a public health risk and a conservation, as a conservation impact. This is a more recent map, but it shows you a little bit of the trade routes between Africa and Asia. And it's just to confirm that all countries and all region are affected by, uh, by wildlife trafficking. Now, if we talk about wildlife markets, wildlife markets are, now we've seen with COVID-19, a, a very strong public health risk because they force animals from different species to be at proximity from one another and at proximity to humans. But they're also uh, very often unregulated or poorly regulated and offer a mix of legal and illegal specimens, which creates a very, very strong difficulties for enforcement with enforcement officers having difficult it's impossible to distinguish between legal and illegal specimens, so it complicates enforcement. It also increases demand. And those markets very often are unhygienic and facilitate the spread of disease. Um, I'm giving you here um, a, a quote from a letter that was sent from Congress to the WHO, the UN, the World Organization for Animal Health, that give you a little bit of perspective of the conditions in particular that affect wet markets. Wet markets um, are markets where you can find um, animals that are live animals and you can ask the seller to slaughter them for you and you can pack the meat with it. And so you're exposed to a lot of blood and a lot of um, substances that facilitate the spread of disease. Our recommendation at Born Free USA is to close wildlife markets because of the public health risk, but also and for because of the conservation impact that these markets are having and because of the mass extinction event that we are currently experiencing. If you think of illegal wildlife trade, you have to understand that, that the threat is evolving. Increasingly illegal wildlife trade as security implications with links to organized crime, links to drug trafficking, and links to terrorism with uh, funding money from um, illegal wildlife trade funding terrorist group. So it's increasingly a priority for governments to tackle just because it's evolving and it has increasing security risks. What you have to keep in mind as well is that wildlife law enforcement is very complex. It's a, it's a type of um, smuggling that uses methods that are very similar to drug trafficking. I'm giving you here an example of the methods that are used for traffic in live animals and wildlife products. Uh, use of secret compartments of luggage, shipping containers or closing, which is what you saw in the previous slide. A more and more common uh, method for smuggling is using delivery services, postal services, FedEx or DHL, as well as a diplomatic luggage. And then the use of the internet where traders are using chat rooms, auctions, websites to sell wildlife remotely. And in the context of international wildlife trade with CITES, CITES is a treaty that relies on a permitting system to monitor trade. And so increasingly, uh, you have traffickers that are going to be forging or stealing trade permits or are going to be misdisclaring what they have, what they're traveling with. They're going to pretend that the species they are traveling with are not protected or they're going to misdeclare 
uh, what they're carrying with them or change the value of the item or declare that a wild specimen is a captive specimen. But all of that to illustrate the fact that it is very, very hard on the enforcement side to stop wildlife uh, trafficking. So some of the work that we have done in, in order to support West African governments in the development of their national response to wildlife crime has dealt with trying to better understand the threat. Uh, wildlife trafficking is very, very poor, poorly understood in West Africa. So we have spent uh, some time, we have sent teams of experts that have been supporting uh, West African authorities in the field, gaining a better understanding of wildlife crime and illegal wildlife trade trying to get better understand the species that are targeted, the nationalities that are involved, the trade routes, links to other crime, trying to better understand uh, species trafficking and as a compounding threat. What impact does it have in addition to all of the other threats that are affecting wildlife? And trying to help authorities understand uh, the enforcement needs they have and what recommendations need to be implemented to, st to strengthen their response to wildlife crime in order to ensure that their policy decisions are stronger for conservation but also for enforcement. So we have led this threat assessment work first in seven countries in West Africa, which you can see circled here with our experts going in the field and doing this work with the authorities. And then we have expanded it to the entire West African sub-region. And while we were dealing, while we were leading this work um, in the field, trying to get a better understanding of wildlife crime as a threat, we also started immediately providing support to authorities with training, as training all across the board was identified as a priority need by the, by the countries. And so we have been doing trainings at all level of the wildlife law enforcement chain, from the level of the rangers that are in charge of monitoring the parks and stopping the poachers, trying to make sure that rangers have sufficient training to uh, stop poachers and to process evidence in a way that would ensure that poachers could be put beyond bars for a very long time. We have also led significant trainings with customs officers. The customs officers are at the border. They're responsible to stop trafficking. It's a very complex task with trying to identify the species that are being trafficked and they have very poor understanding of the rules that allow them to arrest traffickers. So we have had expanded training of customs officers. And then expanded trainings of judges and prosecutors who have a key role to play in stopping trafficker and ensuring that they will be beyond bars for a very long time and they will be sanctioned and deterred. We have also developed uh, some resources to support field officers with enforcement. Um, in the field in West Africa, um, of course, you don't have easy access to the internet and sometimes you have spotty or no cell phone access. And we, find or we found out that a lot of enforcement officers didn't have a good understanding of the species that were protected and, and the form of the species in trade or to recognize what they were supposed to seize and not to have a better understanding of the rules that apply. And so we developed some um, identification guides on paper that they could fit in pocket size kind of guidebooks so that these enforcement officers would have a reference about the uh, legislation that were appropriate to apply and the type of species that were protected. And we have developed these guides for coastal countries uh, in West Africa that are circled here. And because of the increasing number of marine species that are um, trafficked in sharks in particular, we developed in-depth content about the identification of shark species from the fins so that uh, officers that are in the presence of just fins can try to identify the species that is in front of them. In addition, we have started developing um, a phone application, which is called WildScan in collaboration with Freeland. WildScan is a phone application that you can download for free on your cell phone. And through guided questions, for instance, you will be asked, 
Does the animal in front of you have scale? Does it have fur? What color is it? Is it smaller or bigger than your hand? In, than your hand? From a, a bunch of, of guided questions, you will be led to a choice of photos. And uh, through the photos, you will identify the animal that is in front of you. And then you will have access to enforcement information, have an access to the type of protection the animal is receiving, the type of paperwork that you need to be requiring from the person that has it in its possession but also the type of precautions you need to take if you're an enforcement officer and you need to seize this animal, what protection do you need to do? Do you, do you need to kind of adopt, are you going to do risk being bit or what, how to handle the animal in a way that protects its welfare? And one of the good, very exciting features of this phone application is that you can use it as a reporting tool for enforcement purposes, meaning that an enforcement officer that does a seizure uh, can click on a section of the app and report that seizure in real time, which allows enforcement authorities to adapt their enforcement response to trafficking as it happens, which is very exciting. We should see WildScan West Africa launched in the next couple of months. In addition, we've also led quite a bit of outreach. One of the key needs in West Africa is that you have a very poor understanding of the species that are being trafficked for the local population, the fact that these species are protected and that they have a role to play in stopping wildlife trafficking. So we've been developing posters and brochures that have been distributed in ports, airports all across West Africa in the languages that are used uh, in West Africa, which are French, Portuguese, and English. And we have led some outreach work. And so the impact that COVID-19 has had in the field. Well, the first and immediate impact, of course, is that it has, we've seen a freeze in urgently needed capacity building activities. We've seen a closure of borders, closure of airports and ports. So we've had several trainings that have had to be postponed until further notice. Um, we have also received increasing reports uh, of an increase in poaching incidents. Of course, the, uh, the wildlife crime syndicates that deal with poaching and trafficking are highly organized and opportunistic. They see change as an opportunity to increase the nefarious activity to store specimens for future resale. And we've already seen an increase of in poaching incidents reported from the field, as of course, you know, butchers and traffickers are not going to abide by confinement orders. They're going to use this as an opportunity to have less enforcement presence to increase their activities. We've also, also seen an increase in trafficking incidents very, very concerning situation with endangered vultures uh, found dead in Guinea-Bissau. Vultures um, in, in some West African cultures, when that they are associated with uh, some, some belief that they can give you good luck or they can protect you. So there is an increase in, in endangered vultures found dead for potential threats throughout the sub-region. And then some other examples of seizures that have been uh, reported recently. And we've had some very, very concerning appeals from sanctuaries in West Africa that are in need of support to avoid closures as donors are trying to adapt uh, their response to COVID-19. There might be uncertainty about funding in these sanctuaries and sanctuaries in West Africa play a crucial role uh, in, in the wildlife law enforcement chain but also in the preservation of highly, highly jeopardized species with a lot of initiatives that are led to try to ensure that the species that are in sanctuaries can be released into the wild. So it's very, very important to ensure that continued support is made available to these sanctuaries. So some of the work that we have led more recently in response to COVID-19, we've done a lot of policy work. Um, we have joined an appeal from 239 NGOs calling the World Health Organization to recommend a permanent ban of live wildlife markets and the use of wildlife in traditional medicine. We've also started kind of increasing our appeal for a closure of uh, 
wildlife trade, wildlife market, in the context of CITES, we're preparing upcoming CITES meetings with this objective in mind. And we've also launched several appeals to various countries, encouraging them to close urgently their wildlife market and to support the prohibition of wildlife trade. We've continued our enforcement support as well as we could remotely and we are trying to expand it because countries are in, in launching those appeal for continued support. One of the key fears is that because of the uncertainty and the economic consequence of COVID-19, there would be less money devoted to conservation or to wildlife law enforcement support. And that would have very devastating consequences both on the conservation front, but also on efforts led to stop uh, wildlife crime. So we are uh, acti actively fundraising for several of our partner countries to ensure that money is, continues to be available to fight wildlife crime and continue the work that has been led over several years now. And then we're launching what we're calling the Global Nature Recovery Investment Initiative. And this is something which is a very, big priority for our organization. We are calling for a change in scale for the World Investment Response for Nature Recovery. Um, it is very, very important based on this public health crisis, but also based on this mass extinction event that we change the business as usual mentality. We are calling for international commitments to be bold, to be unequivocal, and to really change the dynamics that has led to the spread of these diseases. We're calling for international commitments to halt and reverse biodiversity loss. We want to expand and strengthen protected areas who play a cornerstone role in protecting biodiversity. We are calling for an end of commercial exploitation and trade in wildlife. We want to make sure that all of these changes are implemented with sufficient um, support for the development of alternative livelihoods and increasing efforts for wildlife law enforcement. At the country level, these measures are very close to what we're calling for uh, at the international level. Focus on species recovery, recovery, ecosystem restoration, urgent, urgent need to close wildlife markets, need for support of the local communities, and to focus on demand reduction and an increase in enforcement. And I think the key message is to really reach a change in scale and ensure that all countries' budgets are sufficient to out and reverse biodiversity loss. We're going to be publishing uh, more information on the details of the Global Nature Recovery Initiative on our website as we're still kind of narrowing it down in terms of the economic reform that would need to be supporting these changes, things that would be bold for nature, adopt debt forgiveness programs, debt for nature schemes, incorporate nature-based solutions in development projects, introduce a polluter pays and green taxes more systematically and eliminate perverse subsidies. So again, we will pro be providing more details um, in the near future on, on the specifics of this initiative. Or you can help, I think one of the very, very key message is to help spread the word that it is time for a change, a large scale change. Yes, it is very important to stop wildlife trade. Yes, it is very important to close wildlife markets, but it's not enough. It is very, very important to spread the word that this pandemic threat is also linked to the fact that we are destroying nature. Ecosystems are being completely, they're being reduced, habitats are significantly changing, they're forcing species to live closer to one another, closer to humans. And so it is time to change the scale of their response to ensure that the mass extinction crisis come to an end. It's also very important to ensure that the financial support continues. And I think that it's very important to spread the message speaking to decision makers, speaking to Congress, that the funding that is devoted to wildlife conservation should not decrease and should not be diverted elsewhere. If nothing else, it's time to increase it to ensure that we're not in a situation where the next pandemic is even has more impact. And of course, we care about you, so it's very, very important that you play your role in staying healthy. And before, 
excuse me, before I, I switch to questions, I wanted to give you a little bit of insight of, from the field of the people that are leading the fight for wildlife. So those are the people that are in the field and that are actively every day fighting to preserve wildlife to stop the mass extinction event. On the left of the upper left, you have the Senegal custom officers that are trying to identify ivory, learn how to identify ivory. In the center, you have Mr. Benoit Doamba, who is the Burkina Faso Management Authority for CITES, the former one. And in the course of his career, he's lost multiple, multiple officers to poachers who just shot their officer dead. On the right, you have a photo of Angela, our CEO, at a CITES meeting with the CITES secretary and all of the delegations that are at the CITES meetings that are fighting for wildlife. You can see represented here on the screen delegations from um, Ivory Coast and Niger and Senegal and Sierra Leone, Liberia, Guinea-Bissau. So that the government delegates that participate in meetings to fight for wildlife. On the bottom left of the screen, you see customs officers from Ghana, Guinea-Bissau and Cabo Verde at a training that we led in Ghana, and they are trainers for customs. They are learning how to train customs to stop wildlife crime. In the center here, from Senegal, and ABBA is a conservation hero. He fights at all CITES meetings to try to lead, uh, to strengthen conservation for sharks, for pangolins, for multiple, multiple species elephants. And, uh, see officers from Togo learning how to identify shark fin. And those are the people that we are really need, in urgent need to support because they have a key role to play in curbing the uh, extinction crisis. And I thank you for this chance um, to talk to you. <laughs> thank you, Elise. That was uh, really a wealth of information and and so much is, is happening in this, and it's very timely right now with the pandemic and, and, and the spotlight that's being put on this issue. Uh, we've had a number of questions roll in, so I hope you will uh, take some time to answer these. Um, before we get into some of the more specific ones, I wanna go back to just some more, I, I don't wanna say basic information because it's not basic, but, um, a couple of things that you you touched on, um, one of which is what is the difference between a wildlife market and a wet market, and and I think that the the term wet market is something that is very new to the general public. <clears throat> Excuse me, and we haven't heard that term before. So, what is the, what is the difference? So yeah, so wet markets are markets where you can find live animals that are for sale, but they're not necessarily, they don't always include wildlife. And so they can be, they're, they're called wet because of this, of this practice of you can kill the animal on the spot and get it packaged for you, slaughtered on the spot and be slaughtered for you. So because of, of the blood and the ice melting, they're called wet markets. These markets are all over the world, um, but not all of them have wildlife in them. Wildlife markets are markets where wildlife is being sold, um, and that would be the distinction. Okay. And you showed a really comprehensive map of the trade routes. And, and I'm wondering what markets, well, I should say, I'm not wondering, others are wondering, what countries allow these wildlife markets? Are they only in the places that we tend to think of like Asia, Africa, or are they happening, say, here in the United States? Well, the, these markets are all over the world. Um, the global wildlife trade is driven by demand in a relatively small number of destinations, the US, EU, Japan, China, but these markets are all over the world. Um, there is a very, very uh, huge demand for wildlife in the US. Uh, I was trying to look at some statistics. Um, but you have the US imports over 224 million live animals and 883 million of other specimens per year in average. Uh, so the US is one of the largest consumer legally 
internationally for legal and internationally traded specimens. Between 1976 and 2014, about 1 billion legal imports of wildlife in the US took place. Just to give you an idea of scales, but they're all over the world. They're not in a specifically, specifically in Asia or in Africa, they're all over the world. Okay. And I think this kind of relates to that. Um, does the, the legal trade that you've talked about, is that posing a health risk or is it just the illegal trade that might be happening, you know, either here in the U.S. or around the world that is causing these issues and in particular the health risks that we're seeing these days? Well, I think it's important to note that both legal and illegal trade pose a significant health risk. And the reason to that is that you're forcing animals or species that are not meant to be in proximity with one another, you're bringing them at a market in proximity with each other, you're transporting them in proximity with each other, and also you're forcing them in contact with humans that they wouldn't otherwise have had. I was uh, trying to research this, there's a, uh, just an example of impact of legal trade in the US, in the US that has had a, a public health effect in, in 2003, people in six US states became ill from exposure to the monkeypox virus after a legal shipment from Ghana of 800 rodents for pet trade. Now, after this public health situation, the US ban, the CDC ban imports of African rodents to the US. However, there wasn't a significant risk assessment that was done for imports for rodents from elsewhere. So it's just, it's, it's very, very risky by definition to put wildlife in trade and bring this proximity to humans. It's, it's almost like playing the roulette. You don't know whether or not you will be impacted through zoonotic disease or not. It's, there is no safe way to trade wildlife. Thank you. I'm gonna move on to some questions about the World Health Organization, the WHO. We've had a few of those. Um, first of all, what or why do you think the WHO is not willing, or if they are, to recommend closing wildlife trade and wet markets? What are maybe the obstacles that you see or the challenges that we are facing right now? So, the, the WHO in its messaging has created an ambiguity in that the, they have uh, made a, a statement saying that they wouldn't recommend to close wet markets, which wet market doesn't necessarily include wildlife. Wet market doesn't equal a uh, wildlife market. And, but they didn't say anything about wildlife market and some of the concerns that were brought with uh, the idea that they, we shouldn't close wet markets were because of, of livelihoods and I think one of the very important things to keep in mind when we talk about wildlife markets there are no safe way to keep a wildlife market open and this is why it's very very important to ensure that we significantly invest in communities, in alternative livelihoods, to ensure that these communities do not expose themselves to, to risks themselves and to ensure that they can have um, alternatives to rely on. And then continuing on the WHO line, what, um, what do you know and what is the kind of the position of the WHO or our position on asking them to review their acceptance of the use of wildlife in traditional medicine? So I think that it's, um, it's, very, um, it's very important to have an all-encompassing perspective on the risks that are posed uh, by this trade in all of its forms. And through a precautionary approach, I think it's very important to ensure that traditional medicine is included in the prohibition. Thank you. Uh, so we've talked about the WHO, one of the many international organizations that, that we and, and many other organizations work with. You've also talked about CITES. 
Um, so who are, beyond those, those couple of, of organizations, groups, treaties, what other organizations are responsible for regulating the wildlife trade or, or um, how should, enforcing the, the laws? Are there international groups? And if so, who are they and how do they function in this space? And so if we talk, um, so CITES is the international treaty that regulates international wildlife trade. In terms of enforcement, you have a consortium of institutions that deal with enforcement. And of course, the World Custom Organization would have an important role to play with enforcement. Um, it is very important, though, to focus on raising awareness that governments have the power to act without waiting for an international body to take a decision. CITES has what we call stricter domestic measures, which allow any country in the world to decide to stop wildlife trade and close its market now immediately without waiting. And I think it's very important to raise awareness and, and tell governments, act now, protect your citizens, but also through your action at the national level, protect the world. And I think it's, it's very important, you know, instead of thinking, we need the solution to come from abroad or to come from an international body. It is very important to take ownership of protecting your pub the public, of protecting your citizens. You can act now and decide that you will ban wildlife trade and you will close your markets because of the public health concern and because of the conservation risk. And as we, we look at the, the global community, which international organizations do you feel that we can look to, we as Born Free, we as, you know, meaning possibly the public, to look to for leadership, to make sure that we, and, and this is a direct quote from one of our questions, build back better as we implement the Global Nature Recovery Initiative? Well, I think, CITES so is a key role to play because of international trade. But as I was saying earlier in the discussion, I think it is very, very key to address this beyond CITES and to address this through the international discussion that are going to be led on the global biodiversity framework, on the sustainable development goals, all of these high-level discussions, this is where this will be solved, is to ensure that the goals for humanity that are set by the leaders are ambitious for nature, and that these goals will be accompanied by sufficient financial support to ensure that all the countries in the world have the means to implement these nature recovery plans and the development of alternatives. It, it's, it's of crucial importance and all of these issues are linked. If you think of the climate change discussion, you can in, in, include a, a momentum for, for wildlife conservation and species recovery in these discussions and they're intricately linked to the global biodiversity framework discussions within the CBD. Okay, I am going to jump over to another question from Renee. Is Born Free engaging with the One Health approach, which is developing to transform the health of the planet, animals, and humans as one connected entity? Uh, she says there are a number of organizations and summits slash conferences which bring the One Health approach to different sectors, including environmental health, ecological, animal, individual, and public health and health economy. Do you have a comment on that? Oh, thank you. No, that's a very good question. I'm very glad that this was brought up. This is something that we are reviewing as part of the Global Nature Investment Recovery Initiative, and it's something which we're going to be exploring further. And I think that the, the idea is that all of these issues are linked and complementary, and that we cannot tackle what, you know, wildlife recovery issues, nature recovery issues in isolation from the health discussion. And the One Health um, platform, I guess, provides a, a forum whereby these issues can be discussed together, and that is very positive. And maybe you can expand on that just a bit for another question, which is, will we be rolling out the new initiative globally? Or is this going to be primarily focused Africa and U.S.? 
No, the, the goal that we have is to really raise awareness globally for this because it's, it's a problem that is affecting the entire planet and it is something that we, we need to raise the awareness of governments all around the globe. It's not an Africa issue, it's not a US issue, it's not an Asia issue. And, and it is so true even of, of any kind of work that we do, we always try to build collaborations between Africa and the US, between Africa and Asia. That is true anyway from our capacity building work. But I think in the context of trying to prevent the future pandemic and trying to stop the extinction crisis, it would not be wise to limit ourselves to the US or to Africa. We are hoping to launch it internationally to raise the awareness of governments that now is the time to act without waiting any further. That's, that's great. I think we have time for just a couple more questions that I'm going to put out to you, Elise. Uh, so as wildlife is defined by the, the Global Nature, Nature Recovery Initiative, does that include stocks of commercially exploited oceanic fish species, such as cod, tuna, sardines, and other invertebrates, maybe bivalves, crab, or lobster? Well, I think it's very important that, I mean, the, this, the idea is that we were going to be, we need to kind of have the message spread across all the wildlife combined. And this is not something where we're going to say, we're just going to limit ourselves to mam mammals in Africa. We, we have to have an all encompassing perspective because the mass extinction event is affecting all species. And so the specifics of, of the initiative we're hoping to launch very shortly. But the idea with regard to that is that you do not, nobody has an interest in having a narrow definition of wildlife in this context because we are facing an extinction crisis and all wildlife is impacted. I think that leads to another question here is, as we know, this is not, uh, the solution to the problem is not just in addressing animal cruelty, in addressing the disease factors, in addressing biodiversity or habitat loss. It needs to be a well-rounded approach that, that also addresses the community and the people who are involved. So our, our, the question that we have here is, you know, how do we comment on, say, perhaps China's attempts to address the socioeconomic factors that go into allowing wildlife or wet markets to operate. You know, how do we look at or, or have the conversations on possible solutions that address the economic impact and the, the socio impact of, of what makes these these markets necessary for the people in the areas. And I think that's something we see not just in China, but in uh, developing countries and, and, not, and, and developed countries as well across the world. No, and, and I think this is why there won't be a one size fits all solution. It will be the responsibility of countries to have, ensure that everybody is at the table and that they develop bold measures that strengthen nature recovery while at the same time ensuring that the livelihood of communities is not jeopardized, be it communities in Asia or in Africa or anywhere in the world. I think it's very, very important that everybody takes ownership for the crisis that we're experiencing and for coming up with the solution that will be bold and that will include not putting communities in danger because if wildlife trade is not safe, we need to develop alternatives to ensure that these communities would de not depend on it because they're putting themselves at risk. Thank you, Alice. We are coming to the close of our time and I see that there are other questions that have come in. We will do our best to, to answer those. Um, uh, you know, either through the, the chat function or in follow-up communications that we will have. Um, so I want to just, as we come to the close here, I want to thank you all for attending today, for the questions that you submitted. It really contributed to our conversation. And, and if you find that you have other questions or we didn't address yours today, you can email us directly at info at Born Free USA. I'd also welcome you to email me directly at Angela at Born Free USA. 
uh, we are we will be sending out the uh, a recording of this webinar and the slides that come with it so that you can take a closer look at all of those and I'd like to invite you to become a partner in Born Free's work by making a contribution you can go to our website at bornfreeusa.org slash COVID-19 uh, the contributions that you make will help us end wildlife trafficking and make this world a better and safer place for all involved. There's also a great deal of information on our website and that we will be happy to share with you uh, to address possibly more of your questions and, and get deeper into this, this subject. So finally, we will be following up with an email in the next couple of days with contact information that I just cited you for your support of Born Free and your interest in ending this cruelty to animals and protecting our planet, our wildlife, and the, the world that we have at our hands. Thank you very much.